Um, I'll be introducing Tony. I've done some work with her in the past. I'm from the Institute for Sustainable Futures. My name is Dean Pham. And so we've had a working relationship um, for the last couple of years, um, working with some communities in King Lake in uh, Victoria. So I'm um, excited that I will introduce Tony and her, and her work. So, I mean, this is a great, I mean, it's fantastic to have a second keynote speak after Marguerite's um, talk. We have very different perspectives here on um, water management and the social dimensions of water management. Tony Meek is a um, the, uh, community engagement manager for Yarra Valley Water. Uh, what's interesting about Yarra Valley Water for people who are international guests, it's probably one of the most innovative water authorities in um, Australia, I would say. And Zoe might be able to. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and innovative in a number of different ways. In, in my own work for Tony and at Yarra Valley, we've had really close relationships with the users of new technologies and supporting them adopting, for example, integrated water system in King Lake and the urine diversion toilet system. And they actually had input into how the direction, the, how input into the direction of the trial when we set this up two years ago. So, um, so in the. I just wanted to mention also, I was thinking about in the early stages of planning um, this, this conference, we were talking about how it wouldn't it be great to have industry involved somehow in uh, sharing our perspectives on these social dimensions of um, water management. And we're lucky enough to have um, Tony give a um, keynote at the conference. But I think also it's really important to note that it wouldn't it be great to be able to hear about what innovative sort of practices are happening at a water industry as well, within an innovative um, water utility. Um, and sort of, yeah, have this sharing back and forth of what we're doing. It's not just about um, theorising about potentially what could happen in the water industry, but actually sharing with what could happen on the ground. So I'm really happy that we can have um, Tony involved. And in the break, as we were speaking about Marguerite's presentation and thinking, wouldn't it be great if Marguerite could come to Yarra Valley Water and he would talk to the engineers? <laughs> <laughs> They yeah. need it more in Sydney. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but at least the um, you know the community engagement team are really open to doing those sort of things, inviting someone in to discuss these sort of issues. So, you know, if you have a look at Tony's sort of job descriptions throughout her working life, this is one word that becomes really apparent: is community, engaging community. And Tony's various roles involved, um, you know, a great deal of linkages between um, bringing different groups together to resolve issues of mutual concern. And these range from developing you know, housing options for disadvantaged groups, and she worked as academic in, in social work, um, working with families in crisis in involving environmental disputes, and the current role involves working in the water industry um, on water uh, delivery options. So um, advocating for the importance of recognising the social context as a core foundation for successful project delivery, Tony has a particular interest in how knowledge and experience is uh, of the community and stakeholders can be continuously used to improve um, project planning and service delivery and better, meeting better customer demands as well as you know, producing maybe alternative services of, um, of provision, sanitation and water provision. Um, so I think maybe it's better to introduce Tony and, and uh, induce the uh, presentation and need to go on any further. So I'd like to introduce Tony. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's it's a real privilege to be able to come and meet with uh, so many people of diverse backgrounds doing some really interesting research and um, for me to have an opportunity to, to hear about that and find out a bit more about what you do and and also for me to be able to uh, perhaps share with you some of the um, applications of what's happening in our sort of research and um, sort of knowledge acquisition activities in what happens on the ground in terms of day-to-day -day service delivery with a water utility. So um, while my talk uh, is entitled Water Genders, Culture, Politics, Water Governance, Inside and Outside the Home, it's a pretty broad interpretation of something. So I'm going to give you my, my views on it. And um, uh, I'll just start off by saying, um, in that day-to-day, day-in-the-life type of approach in a water utility, um, sometimes I feel a bit like how that dog looks just at the minute. <laughs> so, 
So I was trying to find a, an engaging picture to start this um, talk off and I thought that sums it up. So, <laughs> so I hope that uh, hope you'll you'll so see what I mean. Inspiring to get close to the tarts, that, is. I, that could be one way of looking at, or to even avoid it, um, <laughs> if you equate those people with um, other people who I won't mention. But anyway, <laughs> let's let's move along, shall we? Now, my the the overview today I want to give you is is to talk about how water governance plays out within a service delivery context at Yarra Valley Water. I want to then talk a little bit about our stakeholder and community engagement approaches, and then talk about a particular case study that's still a work in progress, and give you an update on um, a, a piece of what we consider to be innovative water service delivery in a, an urbanised area um, in a suburb of Melbourne called Doncaster. So um, that's going to encapsulate um, my, my talk today. So like any talk, I want you to go away with some, um, some sort of key messages about what I think is important in the work that we're trying to do across stakeholder and community engagement. And the things that we've learnt um, have been that really strong investment in effective engagement and ongoing stakeholder liaison and community engagement does build greater community and stakeholder confidence in what we're trying to do. Um, I think also building a very strong internal organisational culture, um, encouraging that effective collaboration um, and working on it and working on it and working on it can really uh, lead to more successful project delivered delivery. And just as a little aside, um, Yarra Valley Water has been working for about the past 10 or 11 years on its internal culture, using human synergistics as a sort of a basis for doing that. And I have to say I was pre pleasantly surprised when I started at Yarra Valley Water to really see how the benefits of that, which in, includes um, aspects of working more collaboratively across disciplines was really playing out in a way that I hadn't ever seen evident before in other places that I'd worked. And that continues to be the case and we're building from strength to strength and I'd have to say in my role in community and stakeholder engagement we've got a really strong foundation and basis to keep moving forward in a very positive way. And th the last point that uh, probably has been a lot of my work over the last 20 years in environmental dispute resolution, where roads are very rocky, um, that for more co controversial projects, while the road ahead may be bumpy, having those investments in strong relationships with stakeholders in the community can make it easier to find solutions when the bumps appear, which inevitably they will. So there's three key points that I wanted to point out. Um, that are, are probably the key messages that I hope you go away with from today's presentation. So what I'd like to do now is just set the scene for a little bit in terms of the operating context um, for the water industry in Victoria. And in my paper I talk a little bit about um, Yarra Valley Water, but for those of you who are from interstate and overseas and probably don't know that much about us, we're a water retailer. We operate out of the, we're one of the, the biggest, well the biggest in Melbourne and there's three metropolitan retailers. We have a customer base of 1.7 million people and we provide water and sewerage services. So, so that's, that's the, the gist of the basics of what Yarra Valley Water does. So for us working in the water industry, it's been a very challenging time and other speakers previously have talked about the drought in Australia. And as a result of the drought, we've had a major shift in community attitudes towards water in the past 10 years. We've really spent a lot of time in Victoria, as have other states, in looking at um, new supply augmentations that have um, caused prices to more than double, so our customers are feeling the pain of that. Um, there's a lot of debate about management of urban water systems and the value that water utilities like us um, deliver to our customers. Uh, we, ha we are regulated, we have what's called the Essential Services Commission who are, are increasingly keen to ensure that our customers do get value for money um, in what we provide for them. And um, large infrastructure projects have a long planning lead time and it started to rain again. 
And I think that's, that's, a, that's a really important point in terms of the, the challenges for us in delivering our services in 2012 and beyond. We've also, in Yarra Valley Water, uh, we, we take up a, 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 an area as, of a major growth corridor in Melbourne. So we've got a lot of greenfield planning going on at the moment. Um, and in those um, greenfield areas, if you like, we've got a lot of mandated third pipe solutions, i.e. We're, we're going to be supplying a, a recycled water supply to those properties. Um, and we um, are also faced with redevelopment in already urbanised areas. So we've been trying to explore different ways of providing services, particularly through integrated water management approaches. And we, we now have a community too that um, has greater access to information from ever, before, from ever before, lots of different communication channels, um, people trying to put their perspective and not always giving the full picture. Um, we have people, you know, I use the word, who are increasingly time poor. Our, our social research, for example, tells us that um, people don't particularly care if it's Yarra Valley Water delivering the service, our brand. They just want to know that when you turn the tap on, it works, and when you, you hit the button on the toilet, it flushes. That's pretty much all most people care about. Um, we are also engaging with a community that's increasingly mistrustful of governments and the corporate sector. And I think um, that's, to my way of thinking, been the result of probably well-intentioned approaches to consult and engage, but really, really risk-averse types of thinking in terms of um, um, what, what people have been prepared to do. So people are getting burnt. They're feeling cynical and mistrustful every time an agency like ourselves or others come out and say, hey, we need to consult with you about this. And people are saying, why should we bother? Um, the policy context and project delivery disconnect is another important consideration. Um, I think when you're looking at uh, canvassing community opinion about broad policy matters, and if we take our uh, 1.7 million people who are customers and, and recently have been engaging about our water plan, which is a, a five-year plan of funding that we provide to the Essential Services Commission uh, in terms of determining um, what our priorities are in terms of projects and service delivery. Now, uh, I think it, at that level, it becomes really hard uh, to, to, to really think, well, what can be an effective engagement approach? And I think the tradition has been to think, well, we could probably try targeting key stakeholder representative groups and then have the odd town hall meeting. And then, because it's difficult, we'll do this amount of work because at the moment, you know, it's really hard to get people to be interested in something. But um, I think we've got to try harder at these sorts of approaches because um, these broad pol policy questions may not be relevant um, when you're talking very, in a very abstract way, but as, as soon as uh, a new piece of infrastructure is going to be your new neighbour, you certainly start to take a bit more notice in what's involved. And I think we have to work smarter in how we understand and engage with the great in the great wilderness that is the, is the community in that regard. Um, now, I, as I was trying to sort of think about this uh, talk, and I, it may not come out too clearly, so I'll read this out, but I read The Age every morning and there's an, a reader poll every day. I know it's really uh, not sound statistics, but um, I think it just highlights for me some of the things that people are most important, think are most important. So I'll just pick out one or two. Um, you recall, oh well, for those of you who may not know, there's a, a wonderful horse called Black Caviar. <laughs> most people have heard of Black Caviar, yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, I just happened to read something when she wrote, uh, raced at Royal Ascot and then she had her injury. And the, um, the opinion was, you know, like, does Luke Nolan deserve criticism for his winning ride on Black Caviar? 18,110 people responded to that particular question. Um, now, then you look at, uh, where's another one there? Um, are our politicians putting politics ahead of, um, by, oh, I can't read that, it's sort of come out, but, but ahead of um, the causes of, of asylum seekers? 2,682 votes. 
Oh, lies. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, so in other words, you know, a lot of us in this room would see that as a, a really important question and black caviar is clearly captured the minds and hearts of many people more than asylum seekers in that regard if you were very black and white about it. But um, I, I started to put my presentation together when I was reflecting a bit more on some of the challenges around community cynicism and you'll see as I discuss the case study why I was probably in a bit of a darker thought process at the time. And then just recently I was reading The Saturday Age and Lunig had a cartoon that I just couldn't resist because Welcome to our world in what we are trying to do in delivering policy. So I'll, I'll, I'll just let you read that, but I think it's pretty clear, again, it's a bit, a bit of another example of the black caviar example where the matters that are significant, significant to society at large, we would all agree in principle, are, are, are kind of not as well read as others, like nude mum stalks injured footy star. <laughs> so... I just thought that summed up a lot of what it's like going to work some days for me. <laughs> so, oh, look, uh, it's not quite that bad, but I just think <laughs> Okay. So, so, you know, this is sometimes what our work feels like. So, who do people really trust? It probably isn't us, but it's likely to be someone just like them, somebody who just lives up the road. Um, and why is that the case? Well, if you consider some of the wider policy analysis and debates around climate change and governance that are happening at the moment in the media, um, these are arguably, arguably dis diminishing the significance of and the public's views of this important issue. And there's been like, quite a lot of commentary um, happening at the moment about this. And, um, I recently received a copy from the Victorian Women's Trust of a switch in time, restoring respect to Australian politics. And I want to give that a little bit of a plug. It's only been released in the last month or so, but it's a really important commentary on um, the way politics are being played out, the lack of civility in, in conversations and debates and, um, and just some of the challenges that the current um, federal government has in relation to um, trying to govern a country um, being, um, you know, a minority government. So I commend you to read that uh, because to me it really gives a very good uh, picture of the kinds of challenges that our community is facing as a whole. And um, and I think this aspect of civility is is really apparent in. Um, everyday matters of water governance in the, in the sort of work that we do in having to cite important pieces of infrastructure in communities where they would rather not have them or, or having to disrupt them because we have to dig up the street or um, take away a little bit of public land for a couple of years to build a new sewer and, and how those things impact on communities. Um, Another thing that I just want to mention in, in how our research informs our approach um, is that we, we are constantly monitoring and we are trying to really make sure that we do understand what our stakeholders think of us and how we approach things. And um, we do this quite regularly and, and our, our intention is to take on board the feedback and um, really... Um, act on it and make sure that we do listen to what stakeholders and the community is telling us. So um, the last um, piece of research that w we did was in 2011 and as you can see from the points that we were, we were very positively uh, reviewed by our stakeholders. Um, those last two um, points um, about being collaborative and leading and um, and also being customer focused and um, our work culture have been ex sort of really um, praised by our stakeholders. But there were a couple of things that were we, we learnt about from our stakeholders that we are still trying to um, get our act together more on, which is this whole tension that we have between sharing and leading, um, where good ideas and some interests could be excluded. So subtext of that is I think sometimes we can be still a little bit arrogant and um, we need to keep working on be 
making sure our communication with customers and uh, the way we deliver our services are as efficient as possible. So there are a couple of pieces of things that we're trying to look at in terms of uh, being more collaborative. But uh, by and large, we've got some really good feedback. Our customer research, which I'll um, just leave you to read for a moment, is also giving us some really important information um, that is, is heartening for us, um, but um, it also um, gives us a few little challenges in how we go about delivering the services. And point three in particular is one I want to mention, the anxiety about how the drought was managed, drought was managed and the augmentations that have been commissioned. Subtext for that would be the current controversy that we have around the construction of a desalination plant in Victoria in, that has, has and still continues to create a lot of community angst. And you may have read in the media or heard of recent times where we've all got the community has to pay for that and um, prices are going to go up considerably as a result in, uh, in order to be able to do that. So I've just tried to give you a bit of a basis for how our research informs our actions in what we do. Um, in keeping with the theme of this conference, looking at combining the sciences, humanities and social science research, I just want to um, kind of just for a few moments look at how that all comes together. And I'll just make a couple of points of that and show you a wonderfully fabulous diagram that looks and links it all together. And then I'll, I'll just give you the um, how it plays out in reality with this particular project that I'm going to talk about. So for a for a day-to-day -day, um, water utility, um, for us it's making sure our customer and stakeholder research does inform and guide our project planning and service delivery. And that we do encourage cross-disciplinary involvement in project delivery um, from inception through to actual completion. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of an overview of how we do that. Um, we have a broad corporate strategy. Obviously our brand is important to us. Um, stakeholder engagement is critical to us. I mean by the key stakeholders there I'm referring to our major shareholder which is the Victorian government and other key uh, government agencies and bodies. And then we have um, the community, our customers, the people who are directly or indirectly impacted by our project work, and then the corporate stakeholders um, that we have to also keep in mind. And then making sure that the way we run our business flows into that whole framework of sorts. So that's just to give you a bit of a, a snapshot of um, how we do that. So. Coming out of that, I just want to talk a little bit about community engagement and the sort of principles that we try to inform our practice. And that is that communities have a right to be involved in the key decisions that affect them and their environment. That there are a range of diverse perspectives and opinions and expertise out there that can enhance our decision making. And that effective engagement depends on trust, mutual respect and clear communication. So, those are really important principles for us to um, anchor our work. Um, so while we do, the way we do that is by regularly keeping people informed, keeping them involved, um, asking for opinions and feedback on our activities, um, seeking their commitment to follow our advice. And while the drought was on, for example, water saving, we had uh, tremendous success in really getting people's behaviours to change in terms of water conservation. And um, people really embraced that, which was terrific. Um, it's important for us to honour our commitments and lastly, working with us on changes. And I think that's what Dina was alluding to in, in her introduction too, where we are trialling some quite innovative servicing solutions, but they are fundamentally going to change the way people behave and adapt to these technologies. And that sort of thing is going to be increasingly um, paramount in, 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 I think, in uh, water services and their delivery into the future. And 
and we have to work closely with our customers because we are, in many respects, asking them to, to really shift their attitudes on some fairly complex and sensitive things. So for our community engagement team, how does this play out in a project? Um, in the ideal world, we hear about the um, idea when it's first being considered. Um, I use the word ideal because that's a work in progress, but we, in, in engaging with our engineers in designing projects, um, have become uh, more part of the initial project team, which is a great thing because we can, uh, an example of what we do there is when an engineer says, I need to do this project, we'll say, fine, okay, first step, we're coming out to you to see where this is happening. We encourage site visits and we, it's, a, it's a mandatory um, requirement if we're going to work with them. We go out and look at where this thing's going or whatever it is um, because you can learn so much from doing that rather than um, sitting at a computer screen looking at a, a, an aerial map. Um, we get involved in the conversations and discussions with our project management managers that ensure that all project dimensions are being considered. Uh, so we're pretty much the community advocates. We're there to, to sort of suggest ideas or this is how this might be received. We contribute to the risk assessment conversations by uh, increasing that advocacy, particularly uh, with our ongoing liaison with stakeholder and inter interest groups. We can have a fairly current um, kind of idea of what people's issues and concerns are. And then we put all that together to help in the final project design. So that's how the theory of it works. How, how does it work in practice? Well, I think on the less tricky projects um, where the risks are rather low about community perceptions, it's easier to kind of aspire to, have to implement best practice principles. Um, but Sometimes on the more tricky controversial projects, um, potential controversy shouldn't equal risk aversion in our thinking, but it sometimes does. And that can be often played out in the timing and the extent of engagement, and particularly when we're working with government bodies and, and politicians who like to make announcements about things and um, the timing of when we're able to talk about it. Um, and we continue um, to work on ways to avoid these kinds of scenarios developing because when things do start to feel a little bit, I think, um, con contentious, I think while we, we might be wanting to be open and collaborative, that pressure can sometimes get us to revert to type, which for some, some people in the water industry, the word controlling is something that um, is, is used a bit in a lot of, and a lot of government agencies too, control, control, and oh, we've got to control this because if we don't, it'll all just go um, haywire uh, and we'll be out of control and there'll be outrage and all the rest of it. Well, hello, that's going to happen anyway. Um, so uh, why, not, why not design something that's going to really tackle that and address that, I would say. So for us about uh, these kinds of complex matters, it's important that we do think about it from that point of view where you are really trying to keep that engagement, that communication open, it's fair, it's equitable and inclusive, that we share, um, we have a shared purpose in what we're trying to do with what we do with our projects, that we improve the quality of our engagement with, with learning from experience. We try to debrief when we have a project completed and what have we learned and what we can take into the future so that we can avoid the mistakes of the past. And um, having a shared ownership of the issues is really comforting, that it kind of enables all viewpoints to be reflected. And I think that old adage of through conflict, better decisions are made, even with your own colleagues, is a really important one that should be um, thought of very carefully. Um, it's important that we are not the experts and, and that the presentations that I've heard so far um, that throughout the day have really emphasised there's a lot of different ways of acquiring knowledge and sharing experience and we should be open to that. And um, we should also make sure that when we are delivering these sorts of projects that we are constantly trying to provide accurate and timely information. Now I want to just turn to give you an example of um, a project that we're in the middle of um, determining. 
Minas, which is Doncaster Hill. Um, and um, it's part of um, the Victorian government's 2030 planning framework. Located, um, I don't know if many people know Melbourne, but there's a Westfield shopping town, which is one of those big shopping complexes, approximately 20 kilometres east of Melbourne and um, the CBD. And the, the plan is to have a lot of high rise offices, apartments and retail outlets. And over the next 10 years, approximately 4,000 new dwellings are going to be built. And we've developed a strategy on how to service that particular community using a third pipe with the council, which is Manningham City Council and Melbourne Water. Um, so the reason we're doing this is the challenges associated with the potable water supply system being, um, there be extra demand. We've mandated a, 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 what we call a class A recycled water scheme in the area. So all new dwellings need a third pipe in the future which is quite uh, revolutionary for a, a, an infill development in an urban setting. And um, the recycled water will be available to be used for toilet flushing in the laundry and garden watering. We're going to reduce water consumption by up to 30% and reduce the amount of nutrients into Port Phillip Bay, which is an issue for the environment, and use less energy than with a conventional servicing approach. It's actually going to involve mining the sewer and um, constructing a, a treatment plant within a residential setting. I've given you a bit of an artist's representation of what it might look like, and that was in the proposed um, location, um, and things have changed a little bit since then. We've um, been having to look at all the, the challenges associated with doing that, which is that it is going to be a, close up and personal to some people. Um, people have been concerned about the operation of it, concerned about property values. It has required a planning permit and an EPA works approval and public consultation has been part of that. Um, we have developed quite an extensive engagement strategy where we did aspire to adhere to all the principles that I've just alluded uh, to in um, the earlier part of my comp um, presentation and trying to be as proactive as we can with people. So what happened, however, was the, the council decided to reject the planning permit application, even though it was a partnership with us. Uh, subtext for that is the council elections were just held and the planning process took a bit longer than we thought and councillors were feeling uncomfortable about not being re-elected, I suspect. Uh, in the meantime, EPA Victoria approved the works approval and but we've decided we're not going to pursue the uh, project in that location. So we're a little bit of a hiatus at the moment, but we remain committed to delivering recycled water to that area and considering the best options. Um, I just want to reflect quickly on some of the media that we've had in that um, thing before I finish up, which is that we've got some really diverse opinions about these sites, the kinds of things. We've had the anti not in my backyard type of um, people and we've had people that are saying hang on this is a really important project for the community so we've got some quite interesting debate going along at the moment and this former councillor didn't stand for re-election but probably sums it up in terms of how a lot of us have been feeling and thinking about this particular project. But um, I think in, in summary and in conclusion, I would just like to just make a few points about what I think innovation does for us. We'll continue to do this kind of work, um, but we have to be clear about what we are consulting about and what constitutes meaning in, meaningful involvement with stakeholders in the community. Um, how we go about timing these things, which often can be constrained by other things like the political landscape and announcements and wanting to keep things a little bit um, uh, behind the scenes until an announcement is made, for example. Um, we're getting lots of good feedback that these are important projects to do uh, from the broader community, but citing them is a challenge in itself. Um, it's really important to keep everybody up to date with issues externally as well as internally and I think in a large organisation that's really important that you can sometimes lose sight of that. And um, that lastly innovation can sometimes cost the community more in monetary terms but be more sustainable so how do we keep people engaged on the journey along to get that support? 
So to sum up, and this is something that I just had, I've been wanting to do this since I finished my master's thesis, but I think it sums up my day, daily work life like the dog. Um, so in the, in the very topography of professional practice, there is the high, hard ground overlooking the swamp. On the high ground, manageable problems lend themselves to solution through the application of research-based theory and technique. In the swampy lowland, messy, confusing problems defy technical solution. Bracket my work, um, <laughs> our work. Uh, the irony of this situation is that the problems of the high ground tend to be relatively unimportant to individuals or society at large, however great their technical interest may be, while in the swamp lie the problems of greatest human concern. So my thought is that we just have to keep getting our feet wet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for using the Robert Schoen quote, which I use too, and I think it's a very a great one. Um, I guess I have three questions, but your Schoen quote brought up the fourth one, and so perhaps it's the meta question. If you wanted to innovate more in the space that you occupy, does the constraint come from the community, or does it come from the organisation and worldviews of your colleagues? So that's the meta question. Mm -hmm. And... But below that, I had some questions about how you differentiate between stakeholders, customers, consumers, what's the boundary around those sorts of issues, uh, and, and, and a question about differentiating between the idea of a stakeholder and actually how you engage in processes that build someone's stakeholding so that you don't mm. assume that they're all about to be a stakeholder. Yes. Wow. I'll, I'll try and um, do that um, briefly. Um, yeah, look, I think I'd probably sum up by what you're saying is that there's a lot of tensions and contradictions that we have to deal with. And, and I think the thing that um, I find is really uh, important is to just really be open and listen and receptive and, and really identify the issues, needs and interests of each party that helps, I think, then define the stake they want to have in it or how they might like to be involved. And then, importantly, ask them how they want to be engaged. Um, don't assume anything. So I'm really, really, um, I'm really, really strong on trying to keep that personal contact to be able to review and con continuously um, think, well, are we on the right track here? And, and almost like a piece of action research and getting feedback that can help us to tweak the process. So um, that's a very amorphous way of answering your question, but I've probably left a little bit out as well. But. Well, can I just re-ask Ray's number sure. two? <laughs> well, it was just, um, Tony, I really enjoyed the presentation too, um, but I sort of picked up on the difference between community and customer. You know, I know, you know, as a water retailer, of course it makes sense for you to talk about customers, and yet it struck me that Yarra Valley, in terms of its engagement and so on, like a customer is somebody who, you know, goes and buys a commodity, who doesn't have a lot of, um, other than buying power, who's not a, it's not an enfranchised position, mm -hmm. it's not a, you know, political position, it's not a position of responsibility, all you've got to do as a customer mm -hmm. is to consume. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you talk about somebody who's a community member or a stakeholder or something, you're talking about people who are presumably citizens. Mm. They might vote, they might belong to social institutions, they connect with people outside their tap, outside their bathroom, if you know what I mean? Mm. Like, mm. like mm. they're in the world. Yes, yes. And, um, and that's one of my, you know, in, in research I've done with the water companies, I get very confused about how come everybody just goes totally for the customer model. Mm. Even ones like Yarra Valley Water that are actually, to me, seeming to try and have a much more di a different and richer view of mm. your constituents mm. besides customers. Mm. So I just wonder if you get tangled up in that yourself. Oh, I think we do. I think we do. And I think... Um, how can I put this? There's this word called marketing. And... Uh, oh, no. Yeah. And uh, I think... And I... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the M word. Yeah. Let's call it the M word. Mm. And uh, I work in marketing and communications. That's our, our division. And I think that's where some of the uh, some of the, the challenges for us come because 
I try to differentiate our work within that context in saying, yes, there's lo our customers, many of them would never meet with us face to face. The only contact they'll have is maybe once on the phone or twice. Uh, look, can I query the bill or, you know, my meter isn't working or something like that. And that may be the only contact we ever have. But in our role with our, some of our infrastructure work, we're more up close and personal. So that's how I distinguish community, or rename, our customers become more involved with us than just a simple in a telephone interaction over the phone. I think the most important thing is that we segment out the, the purpose of what we're trying to communicate about. And then, um, and really, um, that helps to then define the kind of relationship we have with them. That's the way I'd look at it. I think we also get caught up on the branding thing of um, reputation, brand, and being a recognised brand, which is a, a little bit interesting when you're a. Um, um, we do, our customers don't have a choice. We're a monopoly. Exactly. And That's so. Why I me, me neither. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, I shouldn't say that. No. <laughs> I'll take that off the. Where's the video? Yeah. No, but I think all I'm saying in that is it's a it's a it's a real tension that you have to deal with, and I think it's about really clearly defining the issues and interests. I try and put a like a negotiation based model over it. Principled negotiation helps me to think clearly about the project, the issues, needs, interests. What can we do to assist that? and make sure that we've checked out that those are really the issues, needs and interests. So we work with the customer in the background going like this and sometimes it has more relevance than not. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go back early on. You, um, uh, you said that some of the challenges for you as an organisation and one of them was people getting frustrated that their actions aren't really influencing their bills. And I presume that you were alluding to people Implement, implementing water saving technologies or practices mm -hmm. and not really making an impact in terms of their water usage or in terms of how much they pay for water. Yes. So I'm just kind of, um, I thought, could you explain to me why that is and how that frustration is manifesting itself and how you can overcome it? Yes. Well, I think part of the thing is that I, uh, my earlier point about people seem to only want to know about the water, the tap turning on and the toilet flushing. The whole story we'd love to tell about how water pricing happens and how tariffs are determined and all the rest of it, that people are too busy to even understand that. And, and it's very complex as well. But we really have to try harder at explaining and engaging about that. And um, we, the angst comes about usually when we um, send out our quarterly bills and particularly when we have added charges once a year where we put a drainage charge on behalf of the government and Melbourne Water and a parks and waterways charge and then the surge of anger just comes back through our, our contact centre. So we have scripts for our, our contact centre people and so it goes on. But one of the things that we've done recently that's been more deliberative, I think, is, and is working to some extent that I'd like to see happen on a wider scale is in consulting with our water plan, which we've now given, sent off to the Essential Services Commission, we used a process where we engaged people through a workshop. We took a, a cross-section of our customers in a statistically valid sample, asked them to come along to a workshop over four hours, paid them to come, had a little piece of information, gauged the changes in their um, attitudes based on more information than what they currently knew. And by the end of it, they understood it and got it a bit more in terms of how, how these things worked. Um, it has to be brought back, I think, to a point where they can see the, the relevance and that in terms of water pricing, consuming less with the current tariffs doesn't mean you get less, you pay less. But we're looking at that at the moment in this next um, round of um, funding that we're applying for with the, um, the Essential Services Commission. The other thing that's really hidden in what we do is all those 9,000 9, odd kilometres of pipes we maintain that are all invisible. And so at every opportunity, if I can, when I go to speak to interest groups, we'll get hammered about the cost of water. And then I'll say, and by the way, those other charges go towards a $650 million sewer that we've just put in 12 and a half kilometres underground between uh, reservoir and Coburg in the northern suburbs of Melbourne to, 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 to help with that northern growth corridor and they go, oh, I get it. So it just takes a little bit more of an opportunity to, to, to have a conversation with people where they start to see and can at least accept a little better where their, their money's going. 
It's an ongoing work in progress.